Welcome. My name is Giulia Vigiani and I am a professor of infrastructure geotechnics. So for, for those of you who don't know, geotechnics is a branch of civil engineering. So I am a civil engineer dealing with soils and rocks to create foundations, earth dams, levees, embankments, and more relevant to this lecture, underground space. So, um, I'm gone. Uh, when I was approached by our admission tutor that you've met uh, uh, a little while ago about giving a lecture for this masterclass, I tried to think of something that would be uh, sexy enough, can I say, to show that civil engineering can be as fun and challenging as robotics, computer vision and AI, but also to show how fundamental understanding, in my case, fundamental understanding of soil mechanics can be used, can be applied to engineering problems. And so I thought that perhaps artificial ground freezing might be the right topic. However, as I was preparing this lecture, I realized that the way reality works uh, in engineering is often the other way around. So that is, it is engineering applications that call to fundamental understanding. So artificial ground freezing is a classical example of a construction process in which, uh, uh, which is implemented in practice, so you do it, but there is a very poor understanding of the underlying phenomena. And this implies that possibly you, as an engineer, you tend to use unnecessarily high safety factors because it's kind of uh, don't know factors. And this means that you are wasting resources, possibly you are increasing your comfort, carbon footprint. So I, I want you to bear in mind that sometimes things can go the other way around. So it can be the engineering applications that call for for us engineers to make an effort towards more fundamental understanding. So my presentation will start by giving you a little background on the city of Napoli, where a relatively recent extensive and successful application of uh, artificial ground freezing was carried out during the construction works for line one of the underground system. And I will give you an overview of the project layout, ground conditions, design issues, and the use of artificial ground freezing. I will then try and summarize the main observed phenomena, to a certain extent, the problems encountered during construction of the first station at Garibaldi, so the early applications of the method, and then describe some relatively simple uh, decoupled heat propagation analysis and the way they could be used to optimize the method and gain control over the construction process. Now, I uh, also would like to tell you very briefly about the thermo-hydromechanical couplings that arise when you freeze soil, which means that I will have at least to hint at some of the underlying theory and show you some of the experimental work that was carried out on freezing soil. So I'm moving from engineering applications towards more fundamental research. And then to close the loop, I would like, uh, close the loop with applications, I would like to see if what we learned along the way can be used to predict the behavior on other cases. And in particular, we'll use the, the example of a more recent station, that is Toledo station that was constructed much later on during this uh, engineering project. So the city of Napoli, with a population of 3.6 million, Napoli is definitely not a megacity, does not qualify a megacity. In fact, in Europe, only London and Paris have a population larger than the required 10 million to be called megacities. Whereas the urban areas of uh, the majority of large European cities is around three to four million people. And uh, here is Napoli, I'd better pick up a pointer, laser pointer. So here you go, this is Napoli. Uh, just about smaller than, say, Milan, Roma, or Barcelona. But if you change your perspective only slightly and stop looking at population, but you look at density of population, then you will find, hang on, I'm trying to get to the right screen. Oops, what's going on? Uh, sorry, my, okay. So yes, here we are, we're looking at density of population and you will discover that Napoli is now the second most densely inhabited city in Europe, well above both London and Paris. So here's Napoli, it's second only to Barcelona in Europe. And this is in part due to the morphology of the city, which is bound between the sea and the hills. In this map, you can see a number of ridges, this kind of circular hills 
that are the, uh, correspond to the ancient craters of the volcanic complex of the Phlegraean Fields, which is located just west of the city. The uh, lower town extends in the plains that are along the coast of the bay. And this is where the uh, historical center and the administrative district with its high rise buildings are located. But then the city also climbs along the, the slopes and spreads on the plateau of Vomero and Camaldoli Hill with a maximum elevation of 457 meters above sea level. And you can appreciate it from this aerial view of the city. So the historical center would be this side of the city on the plains, but then the city is very well built all the way up to San Telmo at 200 meters above sea level and Camaldoli at 457 meters above sea level. Now, um, at the end of the 90s, Napoli's public transport network still suffered from the lack of integration and poor connections with the, uh, the city being notorious for its horrendous traffic problems with a dramatically increasing air pollution. So the quality of the air was getting worse and worse, even if it's a sea town, so it's by the sea. Unacceptably long travel times in rush hour and very negative effect on the city economy and public health. So this is why the local administration put a considerable effort to extend and integrate the existing network of railway connections with a lot of success, I must say. And to date, many, many extensions. Everywhere you see dotted lines, this means this is, uh, this, this dots means that these are extensions that are somehow underway. And once this plan of transport, this is the 1997 transport plan will be completed, 70% of Neapolitans should be living within 500 meters of a transport access point. And in this lecture, I will concentrate on line one of Napoli Underground, that is this very big uh, yellow loop that I am going uh, along with my mouse. Now, uh, once completed, line one of Napoli Underground will form a closed ring, which is connecting the northern suburbs of the city here, the area of the hills down here, the historical center, the central railway station here at Garibaldi, the airport, for a total length of about 44 kilometers and 25 stations. The first 22 kilometers of the line, that is between Piscino and Dante station, were um, completed relatively quickly and were fully operating by 2002. This is the orange and yellow bits in this, uh, in this map. The following six kilometers that are shown in green in this slide, uh, are essentially completed, but for Duomo station, Duomo is not opened yet. Whereas the remainder of the line that is in light blue in this slide is uh, either under construction or at the design stage. Now, this is a close up of the green stretch of the line, which is gonna be what I'm gonna be talking about today. And this proved very, very problematic to build. Essentially because all five stations included in this part of the line, namely Toledo, Municipio, Università Duomo and Garibaldi, the years in brackets are the years in which the stations were opened. As I told you, the only one that hasn't been opened yet is Duomo Station. All of them had to be built in an extremely densely built urban environment. So the, the, the density of the urban environment is amazing in central Napoli. And through loose granular soils, this means suns and well below the groundwater table. So to complicate things further, Significant direct interferences arose between the line and buried archaeological remnants, particularly at Municipio and Duomo stations. To give you an idea, at Municipio, the works exposed the structures of the Roman port of the city that dates to the second century, with the recovery of at least three Roman boats and very, very many artifacts. And the boats had to be packed and removed to take them to a workshop where the wood could be treated for preservation and they will eventually be part of an exhibition area inside the station. This is, hasn't been opened yet. You can see this is something that is very slow and very difficult to carry out. And uh, at Duomo, even worse, because uh, a Roman temple of imperial age with very, very important decorations, mosaic floors was uncovered by excavation. And the importance of the archeological finding, findings in this case was so big that the station had to be completely redesigned. And this is part of the reason why Vomo station is uh, essentially, uh, so it, the station was redesigned to, to look like this, like, you know, with these uh, beautiful things where the, the temple is exposed in the, in the foyer, let's say, in the entrance of the station. And this is part of the reason why Duomo station is lagging behind the rest of the line, because this is requiring even longer than looking after the boats at Municipio. Now, 
This slide shows the soil profile and groundwater conditions along the green stretch of the line, so the, the bit that we're talking about today. All the natural deposits within the depths of interest are geologically very recent. They were formed in a relatively short period of time. The yellow tuff and the Botswanas, so at the bottom of the, of the geological series, the yellow tuff and the Botswanas were deposited as pyroclastic flows during the second active phase of the Phlegraean fields. We saw that the Phlegraean fields are just west of the city. After a period of rest of about 2000 years, during which the pyroclastic materials were eroded, transported and redeposited, a no active phase of the Phlegraean fields, this time explosive, deposited the so-called Neapolitan pyroclastic pie, that is this uh, uh, kind of purple guy here, okay? And this consists of uh, easily eroded alternating layers of pumices, ashes, pozzolanas. Contrary to the belief, the, the common belief, Mount Vesuvius, the eruptions of Mount Vesuvius contributed very, very little to the stratigraphy of the city of Napoli. So all the stratigraphy of the city of Napoli comes from the Phlegraean fields, not so much from the Vesuvius. Now the, the, the pyroclastic soils are covered, they're overlain here by suns or silty suns, and these are essentially of marine origin. And because we are very close to the coast, most of the areas near the coast derive from reclamations that were carried out in historical times between 1400 and the late 1800. And this is reflected in the thickness of the made ground that is this uh, uh, gray guy here, which is relatively thick. It's about 10 meters of uh, of uh, made ground, which is quite important because we are close to the coast and so there is a lot of reclamations. And the other thing I want to, you to notice is that because we are very close to the sea, the groundwater table that is this uh, dotted uh, um, blue line is relatively close to the ground surface. So the tunnels, this is this guy's here going uh, this, this double line here, this is section through the tunnels, were almost everywhere running in the yellow tuff, that is this uh, soft rock, this uh, pyroclastic soft rock. And this was done to minimize interference with the built environment and also minimize the potential damage to, to nearby structures, minimize the possibility of uh, going getting into archeology, span like uh, we ended up uh, getting into with the stations because the fact that the tunnels are this deep, this is a very, very big depth for an urban tunnel. It was, it had, there were a lot of good reasons behind, behind putting the tunnels so deep, but also this meant that uh, the stations had to be relatively deep to reach into the tunnels. So the, this is the, this slide shows the layout of four out of the five stations on this part of the route. Essentially, they all consist of, uh, I should pick a laser pointer again. So what I'm saying is that essentially they all consist of a, of a rectangular shaft here and uh, which contains the, the escalators, all the other plants, whereas the four platform tunnels that are these four guys here and the inclined passageways that are required to reach from the station into the passage tunnel are outside the perimeter of the shaft. Now, the, the shafts are quite deep. They reach uh, uh, between 35 and 50 meters below ground level. They're relatively wide with a typical planet of about 1,000 square meters, and they had to be excavated through 20 to 30 meters of granular deposits. This is suns, uh, and then in the yellow tuff for another 10 to 15 meters, and below 30 to 35 meters of water. So the, the, the water table was 30 to 35 meters above dredge line, that is the bottom of the shaft. And these are very major uh, civil engineering works which require adequate construction techniques, in particular, Support for the excavation was provided by reinforced concrete diaphragm walls, which were created using a hydro mill in 2.5 meter wide and one meter thick panels. These were typically supported by steel tubular props at the surface and four to six levels of uh, pre-stressed anchors. Uh, in some cases, to restrain further ground movements around the shaft, the floor slabs of the station, this is this guy's here, these are the floor slabs of the station, and they were constructed top down as the excavation proceeded to minimize the possibility for the diaphragm walls to, to deform into the excavation. And also part of station construction were the enlargement of the running tunnels to accommodate the platforms and the excavation of the inclined passageways uh, and both of these were done in conventional mining. Now, 
uh, uh, platform tunnels were generally contained within the Neapolitan yellow tuff, which is a fractured soft rock, whereas the inclined passageways were running at least in part in the granular soils that is in the Bozzolana in this case. And in both cases, both platform tunnels and um, inclined passageways are well below the groundwater table. So they have to be excavated under the groundwater table. And this is the part of construction that was carried out with extensive use of artificial ground freezing. Now, what is this? So this technique consists of driving freeze tubes into the ground and then circulating a refrigerating medium into the tubes until the temperature of the ground around the tubes is below the freezing point of the groundwater. Now you can see that the refrigerating medium comes in in an inner tube and then is recirculated backwards, reaches back the surface in the gap between the inner tube and the outer tube. Okay, now this refrigerating medium can be nitrogen, which is liquid at minus 196 degrees centigrade, and then is exhausted in the atmosphere as a gas at minus 120 to minus 50 degrees centigrade, depending, or it can be brine. Brine is a mixture of salt and water, essentially, which is uh, inserted in the tubes at minus 40 degrees centigrade and comes out of the tube at about minus 15 degrees centigrade, but then is recirculated through a refrigeration plant. So the nitrogen is exhausted as a gas in the atmosphere. The brine is recirculated through a refrigeration plant. And uh, in this case, in this case of uh, Napoli underground, the designer required that a frozen wall of one meter thickness, which is uh, conventionally defined as the volume of, uh, of soil that is at the temperature of less than minus 10 degrees centigrade. So they wanted a frozen wall of one meter thickness before any excavation could be carried out under the protection of this uh, frozen wall. In Napoli, both brine and nitrogen were used. Here is the plant to recirculate the brine. So you can see this is all this thing is a, it's a plant that is essentially uh, used to re-refrigerate the brine when, when it comes out of the freezing tubes, whereas this is the the nitrogen freezing, and you can recognize it if you ever walk next to a civil engineering work and you see this white puff, this is the exhaust nitrogen coming back to the atmosphere. And uh, how was this work carried out? So starting from the shaft, freeze holes were inserted by directional drilling parallel to the future excavated section. And then the resulting ice wall, so you're getting uh, an ice wall that is completely surrounding the future section of the platform tunnel that is of course orthogonal to the to the wall of the station and uh, the this ice wall serves both static purposes for the inclined tunnels and hydraulic purposes so it's making the excavation watertight and this is true both for platform tunnels and for the inclined passageways and these features then show how the the cutting of the diaphragm wall which was done with a diamond wire so removal of the diaphragm wall bits. So this is the concrete diaphragm wall that gets removed. And then subsequent excavation of the tunnels. This is excavated by conventional mining. And some of you that have good eyes might notice that there is a frozen soil exposed at the face. So all of this is happening under the protection of a, of a ring of ice with a thickness of at least one meter, okay? Now, uh, the first station to be constructed was the station at Piazza Garibaldi, right in front of the Central Railway Station. And this is a photo of the piazza during the construction works that is about 13 to 14 years ago, showing this uh, red uh, line here is the perimeter of the shaft, of the station shaft. And please note these very massive uh, buildings. These are uh, masonry buildings from the beginning of 1900, which are extremely close to the, the shaft, the distance between the side of the building and the side of the shaft was of the order of one meter, 1.5 meters, and are very likely to be affected by excavation of the shaft and construction of the, of the platform tunnels. Now, this is a section through the long side of the station. So we have one of these two guys, and then you can see this is the, the, the shaft itself. And this slide shows the ground conditions that are completely consistent with what I told you before. So there are 27 meters here of granular deposits of suns, be them pyroclastic suns, uh, seabed deposits or whatever. And then they're followed by the Neapolitan yellow tuff, the soft rock. 
The groundwater table in this case is 9.5 meters below the ground level. There are four levels of pre-stressed anchors, this guy here with a length varying between 12 and 31 meters. And the diaphragm wall, this is the, di the concrete diaphragm wall, is further supported by steel tubular props at the surface and by the floor slabs of the permanent structures of the station. The platform tunnels in this case are completely contained within the Neapolitan yellow tough, so you don't, don't need artificial ground freezing for static purposes. And, uh, uh, but the, I haven't shown in this picture for clarity, there are the inclined passageways that run into the, the, the suns, and so they also need artificial ground freezing for static purposes. Now, this slide summarizes the main construction phases of Garibaldi Station. So excavation of the shaft took almost exactly two years, from 19 October 2002 to 30th October 2004. Once excavation of the shaft was completed, ex uh, uh, artificial ground freezing of the soil around tunnels, platform tunnels A1 and B1, that is the one closer to the buildings, started. And uh, uh, construction of the stations was very carefully monitored. In particular, this is a plan of the uh, monitoring instruments at Garibaldi Station. During excavation of the station, the horizontal displacements of the diaphragm walls were monitored using inclinometers. The pore water pressures, both inside and outside of the excavation area, were monitored by using piezometers. And uh, the ground and building settlements were measured by precision leveling. Not represented in these plans, Instrumentation also included anchor loads. So the, the, the load on the, the anchors that are supporting the retaining walls with uh, using load cells that were mounted on some of the anchors. Of course, not all of the anchors. I think there were something like 554 anchors in this case. And during the freezing stages, ground temperatures were observed using thermocouples installed in observation holes. So, this is a typical layout. So you have the section of the tunnel and you have all the freezing tubes around the tunnels. This is the stage one of Garibaldi station freezing tunnels. And uh, this, uh, the, the checking for freeze tube alignment was very important. Even if the freezing holes were inserted by directional drilling, that is a technique that uh, permits to control very closely the position of the freezing hole over the required length of about 50 meters. So each uh, platform tunnel was 50 meters long, there are unavoidable deviations from the desired alignment. And these areas that I have shaded in yellow are problem areas. These are areas where you might expect uh, problems in the formation of the ice wall, maybe a reduced thickness because there is an increased distance between contiguous free zones. And the temperatures were measured in these green guys, so only in a limited number of uh, secondary holes that are also drilled around. And so you can have the temperature observed in the ground around the freezing holes. And at the beginning of the of the story of this application of artificial ground freezing, the measurements consisted in tiny stress of temperature along the secondary tubes. So simply you were keeping an hour on the temperature and plotting the temperature at the particular tempo couple in time. And this is one of these uh, typical plots. I have a feeling that my PowerPoint has decided to die again on me. Yes, I don't know what to do. Uh, don't worry, it'll give people a chance to start typing their questions, I'm sure. Okay, I, I'm, I'm really upset with this. It never does this. It's, I uh, don't know what's going on. Yeah, there you go. It's come back to life. Is it come back to life for you too? Yes. Okay, so what I'm saying, what I was saying is that at the beginning, people were simply looking at the, the, the way temperature would change in time at this thermocouple. So this is an example. This is uh, five thermocouples at a certain distance from the wall, and this is the temperatures that they are measuring in time. And as you can see, there are two thermocouples, uh, GT11 and GT12, that are never reaching the design temperature of minus 10 degrees centigrade. So you remember the designer had specified that there should be at least one meter of ground that was below minus 10 meters centigrade. And for instance, thermocouple 11 is hardly bothered by the freezing works. It's reaching 10 degrees centigrade and it's not going down. So people didn't know what was going on and were waiting and waiting and waiting. So there were uselessly long wait times before excavation. Uh, so you've seen this slide before. I just wanted you to notice that between the start of freezing and the start of excavation, 
there were nine months wait for the case of tunnel B1 and 11 months wait for the case of tunnel A1. So you're waiting there and you continue to freeze and you continue to waste energy and you don't know what's going on because you don't have a very intelligent way to look at your data. And there are very other very potentially adverse effects on the work. For instance, what we noticed in this case is that horizontal displacements of the diaphragm wall. So we re-zeroed the horizontal displacements of the diaphragm wall towards the excavation. Of course, they were not zero during excavation. The diaphragm wall moved towards the excavation. But then if you re-zero that and start measuring the horizontal displacement of the of the diaphragm walls towards the excavation from the start of freezing, you find that there were nearly 30 millimeters, three centimeters displacement recorded due to freezing. And this is more than the maximum displacement of the diaphragm wall during excavation of the shaft. So it is a very, very large number. And this caused uh, an increase on the load of all the anchors because the diaphragm wall is pushing towards the excavation and is pulling on the anchors. So the nominal load of the anchors increased by, so the, the recorded load of the anchors increased by more than 60% on the nominal load. And some of the anchors were really, really quite close to their pullout value. So I have plotted here the anchor loads in three specific anchors. You can see that these two guys that are close to the crown of the tunnel are really going up. And anchor, the green anchor is really, really close to the pullout value. So there was a lot of uh, worries by all uh, parties uh, involved. And reality is that it is very likely that there was a frozen lens that is, was created behind the retaining wall and was growing and growing and growing in thickness and was pushing the, 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 the wall towards the excavation and increasing the anchor loads. And why should an increase, a, a, a nice lens of increasing thickness below uh, uh, sort of develop behind the, the diaphragm wall. And this is due to suctions. The water is, uh, the, the freezing water is sucking more water towards the freezing front. We'll come back to this. The other thing I wanted you to look at is the, the vertical displacements of the building. So B8 is one of the monitoring points that was established on one of the buildings. And you can see that for this guy, be, besides the vertical displacements, uh, settlements due to shaft excavation, you can see that freezing created heave at surface. So there are these two kinds of uh, bumps in the settlements. This is uh, crown and sides, uh, uh, activation of freezing at the crown and sides. And this is activation of freezing at the invert. This was done in nitrogen. And then there are more settlements and you start uh, excavating the tunnel and then there is water flowing to the tunnel. But really the biggest part of settlements happens when you start thawing the ground. So on thawing, you get settlements that are larger than the heave on freezing. And at one point, these settlements had reached something like 50 millimeters, which is really very big. So there was some uh, remedial work, some uh, protective measures that were essentially underpinning of the foundations of those two massive masonry guys. And so everything stopped. Right. So well, I, I believe that I, I, I can, you know, the, we can improve on the control of ground freezing. The control of ground freezing was actually pretty bad at the beginning of this thing. And uh, uh, the, the control of ground freezing improved by a combination of measurement and interpretation. So the problem of transient heat propagation was tackled numerically using the finite element code abacus in plain strain. And because uh, heat propagation is still just the heat propagation, I'm not talking about any thermo-hydromechanical coupling, but even this is a it's a pretty difficult uh, uh, problem to tackle uh, analytically because you have uh, uh, the thermal diffusivity of ice is about eight times the thermal diffusivity of liquid water. So you have a propagating ice front that is dividing your domain of integration of your differential equations in two areas, that in two regions that have very different thermal properties. And so this is one of the platform tunnels uh, with an equivalent diameter of, uh, oh, why is this not coming to me? It has an equivalent diameter of so 10.6 meters. There are 53 freezing tubes around it. And we examined what was going on considering four of these freezing tubes at this position indicated in the slide, okay? And in particular, the control quantities were quantities that were happening here in this point where I've put my pointer. And we were looking at the temperature at midpoint and the frozen thickness. 
that is the thickness of the ice wall conventionally defined as the thickness of soil that is below minus 10 degrees centigrade. So the boundary conditions in this numerical analysis were 15 degrees centigrade at the mesh boundary and minus 174 or minus 40 degrees centigrade at the freeze tubes, depending if it was nitrogen or brine. And the thermal properties uh, of the ground are those listed in the slide. There is no point in me reading, but I wanted to underline that they were obtained using uh, a, uh, the back analysis of the observations from a field trial of artificial ground freezing with vertical freeze tubes and secondary tubes for temperature measurement. Now, what are the results? So this plot shows the results of the finite element analysis for nitrogen activation. So here we are freezing the ground with nitrogen. If we are using just one freeze hole, two freeze holes, and four holes, and, or four freezing holes. Now, the first thing you can see immediately is that there is a very big improvement if you move from one hole to two holes, but there is hardly any improvement moving from two holes to four holes, which is telling you that the interaction between the freeze holes is limited. So two holes are interacting with one another, but only each pair of holes is interacting. Then the others are too far away, not interacting any longer. And the results are given in terms of temperature at midpoint versus elapsed time and frozen thickness versus elapsed time. And you can tell that if you activate with nitrogen and you use just one hole, it takes nine days before you form the a one meter thick cylinder around the one hole. Whereas if you're using two or four holes, this time goes down to about five days. You only need five days to create the one meter thick wall. Uh, if you do the same thing with brine, so this is brine activation, the process is much slower. It's the same diagram, temperature and thickness as a function of elapsed time. The Process is much slower. Again, one hole is completely different from two and four holes that are exactly the same. Because the process is much slower, you can see, you can read the latent heat release when there is freezing. So there's this kind of plateau at around zero degrees centigrade. And in this case, if you use one hole, it takes more than three months to create a one meter thick cylinder. Whereas if you use two or four holes, this time goes down to about a month. So nitrogen freezing is much more effective than brine activation, but it is very expensive. So it seemed a good idea to activate freezing quickly using nitrogen and then switch to brine for maintenance of the frozen wall. So this uh, implies in order to do this, you have to have three phases. You have to activate with nitrogen, then you have to thaw for a period of time, and then you have to maintain with brine. Why do you need to thaw? Because unless you allow for a, a certain time, the temperature of the ground around the, the holes is at minus 174 degrees centigrade and your brine would freeze into the freezing tubes. So you have to wait for the temperature of the ground around the freeze holes to have come back to something which is above minus 40 degrees centigrade. And while this happens, while the temperature of the ground near to the tubes goes up, the freezing front continues to expand by thermal inertia and so by the time you start brine maintenance, you are well above the one meter that was required. So by numerical trial and error, you can find the optimum uh, thickness at which you have to stop so that when you start brine maintenance, you are at exactly one meter thickness of the frozen wall. Okay, so this is, for instance, the results of heat propagation analysis at the end of nitrogen activation for seven days and then brine maintenance for 26 days. Now, this is all numerical, this is perfect. What, what is life in reality? Now, this is uh, the real position, uh, the constructed position of the freeze holes and observation holes at six meters and 30 meters from the diaphragm wall as measured by Maxibor. So this is not the intended positions, this is the real positions. And then you can see, particularly as you move further away from the, from the diaphragm wall, these tubes are a little bit all over the place. They're not where they should be. So this time we are, uh, instead of plotting time plots of temperature, we are plotting the isolines of temperature around the tunnel at 6 and 30 meters from the diaphragm wall. And because of the deviation of the tubes from the design position, you can see that the thickness of the frozen wall is not exactly, which is defined conventionally as the isoline and minus 10 degrees centigrade, it's much less regular than predicted by numerical analysis. And this type of, of representation 
was made possible through a combination of analysis and data reduction, because you don't have enough points to do contouring, you have to do something which digs into the theory, but I will not go into it. So what I'm saying is that after 26 days of RAM maintenance, things are not so good because at 30 meters from the frozen wall, uh, at 30 meters from the diaphragm wall, the frozen wall is all discontinuous, fragmented. There are a number of holes here, here by the crown. So this is a, a, a problem, but uh, one piece of good news is that this type of representation permits to recognize the problem and act. In this case, nitrogen freezing was reactivated locally at the crown to repair with very good re results. So you could repair the crown and reestablish the continuity of the frozen front. So now we are much more on top of things. We are just not just looking at temperatures in time and waiting, but we know what's going on. And therefore you can see that the wait times for tunnels B2 and A2, where there was this very steep learning curve, we now know how to reduce the data, how to look at data properly, the, the, the wait times reduced from six months to only two months in the case of tunnel A2. Now, I think that all this phenomena I talked about, you know, the formation of the Iceland, the movements of the wall, the increased uh, anchor loads, the heave and then uh, settlement at surface, they're all pointing to the fact that there are some couplings that are going on and they are due to the development of soil freezing. So if we assume that the soil is fully saturated, that is the pores in the ground are completely full of water. When the temperature drops to zero degrees centigrade, then the water which is least bound to the solid surfaces will start to freeze. And as the temperature drops further, more and more liquid water becomes frozen in a progressive manner and water ice interfaces start playing a, a very important role. So these water ice interfaces, if we look a closer look at them, we find that the liquid ice surface tension, so there is a surface tension between the liquid and the ice, and this tension is balanced by a difference of pressure in the frozen ice and in the liquid water. And liquid water will develop suctions and will suck more water into the area that is getting frozen. And this suction is responsible for the growing lens behind the diaphragm wall. Also, as the temperature decreases, the increasing ice content modifies this pore water pressure, which in turn modifies the interparticle contact forces, and this will induce mechanical deformation. So there is hydro, mechanical, thermal phenomena that are all playing together and being combined. And if you want to look properly at this, there is a lot of theory you have to look at. And I don't have the time to go through it, but essentially the thermodynamic equilibrium between the liquid and ice phase of water is expressed by the clausius clapeyron equation, which you might have heard of, where L, this term L, is the latent uh, heat of melting at 300. Uh, 33.7 kilojoules per kilogram. And then you will have to, to look at all a big system of differential equations that are governing the problem. And they are essentially mass balance equations of all the species that are in this problem, the solid, or the mineral, which is always solid, and the water that can be solid as uh, ice or liquid. And then you have internal energy balance for the medium, and then you have equilibrium, that is momentum balance for the medium, loads of differential equations. And because the story is never difficult enough, then these uh, equations will have to be coupled with appropriate constitutive equations. That is the equations that express the relationship between the variables. For instance, uh, say Darcy law for advective flow of water. And one very relevant, very important constitutive equation is the uh, mechanical behavior of the soil, which is not elastic, is uh, elastoplastic. And there are a number of uh, possible coupled uh, uh, elastoplastic models for freezing soils. This is one of them, is the Shimura model proposed in 2009, where you have two uh, stress variables that are suction, the difference between the ice pressure and the liquid pressure, and the mean net stress, the difference between the total stress and the ice pressure. And then you can look at how the elastic domain increases or shrinks with reducing temperature and increasing suction. Doesn't make any sense to go into the details. You have to consider that there are constitutive models that are reproducing, are able to predict both the strength of the frozen soil and the volumetric behavior, how much it will expand or contract during cycles of freezing and thawing. And so let's look a little bit at this particular aspect, the 
uh, contraction, expansion, and the reduction of volume on, on thawing. So we did some tests on the typical Neapolitan soils, so the Taffa and the Pozzolanas, and we put the soil into these uh, guys. These are called the dometers. This is one dimensional compression and extension, so you can apply a mechanical load on the test. But then these things were put in a thermal bath, and so you could vary the temperature of the soil. And what we did was to load at room temperature, then do a cycle of freezing and thawing, and then we would unload at room temperature. So there is mechanical loading, then freezing and thawing, and then mechanical unloading. And what did we see during the cycles of freezing and thawing? We saw that, so the freezing is the uh, blue arrow. So as the soil is frozen, initially it reduces its volume. And then when the, the water starts to, to freeze because of uh, the, the water increases its volume on freezing, there will be a big volumetric expansion of the soil followed up by some more small expansion. And then when you thaw, this thing comes back, but you are left with some compression. So you don't go back to where you started, but you always have some residual volume strain. So you, you your uh, reduction of volume after the cycles of uh, freezing and thawing is larger than the original expansion of the soil. So you can look at it in this plot that is uh, voids ratio, that is the ratio of the voids over the solids as a function of vertical stress. So this is the mechanical unloading, you are reducing the voids. Then you do your cycle of freezing and thawing, and then you do your mechanical unloading. And as you can see, I haven't plotted all of it because when it freezes, it goes, shoots all the way up. I don't have room in this plot, but after the cycle of freezing and thawing, I have accumulated some change of uh, uh, volumes. And this is always true at any particular vertical stress. So this was at 200 kPa, this was at 400 kPa. This behavior was systematically observed on all our samples and uh, is very repeatable. And uh, these are data from the Pozzolana for one of the suns at two different stresses. And the continuous line, so the dotted line is the experimental data, the continuous line is the model. So the model I showed you before, the numerical analysis of this, and it's very good. I think it's very good. It correctly predicts that there is some residual volume strain it correctly predicts that this residual volume strain is smaller at larger stresses. And so it does okay, it does really okay. Only it underestimates a bit this uh, excess uh, uh, compaction. And the reason why we believe is because there are some microstructural changes in these uh, pyroclastic deposits before freezing and after freezing. So this is again another completely different line of fundamental research on the changes of microstructure induced by freezing and thawing on natural soils. Now, just uh, as a side comment, I said, oh, you know, you do this one dimensional things and so on, but because testing of frozen soil is not conventional, any fundamental research in the behavior of frozen soil involves a certain amount of equipment development. So I made it very easy, like saying, oh, I'll put some odometers in a, in a cool bath. What happened the first time we did it is that everything was freezing around it. So this, because this is metal odometer, nothing was moving anymore because it was completely frozen in ice. So we had to modify these odometers and remanufacture a lot of parts of these odometers to be plastic so that they wouldn't get stuck during the freezing stages. So that's again, something that is a lot of fun. Like, you know, if you're an engineer to develop, develop uh, equipment that is meant to test things in very extreme conditions, like very low temperatures or things like this can be a lot of fun. Now I have already overrun and uh, partly because I have been a bit taken, uh, <laughs> taken away by this uh, PowerPoint always freezing, but I had promised a final leap forward or better final leap backward, uh, back to practice by talking about one, the, the last station. So this is Toledo station. This is the only station that doesn't share the same design as the others, because this had to be inserted in such a densely packed urban environment that there was no room for the shaft. So the shaft, the access shaft, had to be placed on a side of the running tunnel. And then all of this, this service tunnel was dug from which the platform tunnels could be built. So it was a little bit more complex and there is this very, very deep shaft that has natural light that comes all the way from surface to this very, very deep thing. This is uh, more than 50 meters deep. 
So, uh, and in fact, it is very beautiful. Uh, this was a very impressive architectural design by a Spanish architect, Tusquets Blanca, and uh, he received a mention as uh, Europe's most impressive uh, metro station. So this is, uh, it's been voted by CNN as Europe's most impressive metro station. It's very beautiful. If you ever happen to be in Napoli, it's worth the trip. Now, these are the, during the entire duration of the works, the surface vertical displacements of a number of reference points were monitored by position leveling. And this slide shows the contours of the final settlement. I don't really want to go into the final settlement. This is the settlement of one of these points. Now, uh, I really cannot remember which one. I think it's in the center of the service tunnel. And this is just due to freezing. So the, the, the soil goes up and then thawing. So this is not the end of construction. We haven't excavated the tunnel yet. This is just freezing and thawing. And you can see that the thawing is creating settlements that are larger than the, heave, than the heave that was created on freezing. So we have the usual problem. And if you do a numerical analysis that doesn't take into account thermohydromechanical coupling, you will never get this right. So in this case, we applied our complex uh, constitutive model. Oh, this is some finite element meshes in which we were modeling the ground freezing. So this is the reduce temperatures around the crown of the tunnel as it was being built. And the good news is that we could predict the temperatures very well. This is uh, measured temperatures versus predicted temperatures. So the temperatures are spot on perfect with what we got in the measurements. And the uh, displacements, ground surface displacements are a little less perfect. But uh, what is uh, nice is that we do get the heave at the beginning, followed by thawing on, uh, on um, uh, you know, the, uh, followed by settlement on thawing. And then we're not doing very well on tunnel excavation, but this is po possibly another story altogether. So we were quite satisfied because for the first time, we're kind of able to predict something which is a bit more complicated than just an increased trend around the tunnel. Now, I have uh, overrun immensely. So really conclusions from a very general point of view. I hope this lecture has convinced you of the deeply transformative nature of engineering and also of civil engineering because engineering, you know, the construction of a strategic transport infrastructure like the one I have uh, uh, told you about this potential to change society. That is to say, to change the quality of life of a large number of people and also uh, the transformative nature of civil engineering is also in the construction processes. And this is mandatory. We need to change our construction processes if we want to address sustainability. That is save materials, reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our environmental impact. I also hope I've been a good advocate of the importance of monitoring. This is not only to keep an eye on the effects of construction, but also to improve our, uh, how can I say, our control of the processes. The, the only way to be effective, to save materials, to save resources, to use less energy, is to be able to control the processes and controlling the processes implies monitoring. Also, you want to collect evidence because this evidence can be used later. So it's evidence that you can hold on because you can use later for a, for a better understanding. In this case, this, uh, this project of, had, had almost a character of a full-scale experiment, providing a unique opportunity to collect data on the performance of the uh, data on the performance of AGF to, to, and this data you can go back to. But monitoring is important, understanding is also important. So I think that uh, the results of monitoring need to be interpreted. And uh, uh, we've seen how interpretation and data reduction could immensely improve the control of the construction process and so limit the, the, the effect. And also it will learn some analysis, it will learn some fundamental research, it will need some uh, theory, some uh, development of equipment. And this can be a lot of fun and then can be fed back into real life engineering. But above all, I hope that I have convinced you that large projects in civil engineering are magnificent opportunities for knowledge. Think of the archeology. span Nobody would have ever done an archeological excavation in the center of Napoli. We found some really good things. So the knowledge is not just engineering knowledge. It's also knowledge at large, research and cooperation. And with this, I think I have finished. I can stop sharing and maybe address some of your questions. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you for bearing with technology difficulties as well. I know that's really tra uh, tricky. So thank you for bearing with that. Um, if you're right to just answer a few questions, we've had quite a few come in. Um, to begin with, um, just kind of a more general question before we move into the kind of the content of your talk. Um, what education and career path did you take? And also maybe more generally, in order to get into these sort of large scale civil engineering projects, what sort of education and career path would one have to take? Okay, so my, my education was uh, in uh, civil engineering. In fact, uh, when I did my specialty, so I, I studied in Italy when the civil engineering degree was a five year degree. So it was a one course that was lasting five years and in the last two years of this degree, you would take a specialty. So in Cambridge, engineering is again a general engineering program in which in the first two years you do general engineering, in the last two years you will take a specialty. I did a general engineering degree in Italy a long time ago, it used to be five years, first three years you do general engineering and then you take a specialty. My specialty was civil engineering, in fact, not geotechnics, but it was hydraulics. And then I don't know exactly how, I ended up doing a PhD in, in geotechnics, so in soil mechanics. And, uh, and then, you know, life happens and I ended up being more of a, of a geotechnical engineer rather than a hydraulic engineer. But I think that it is very important as an engineer that you, uh, that you have a general engineering perspective because the general engineering perspective will give you a very broad view on the topic. So, you know, you know, you know a little bit of uh, electrical engineering, a little bit of mechanical and all these things come into projects and, and that then how do you end up involved with these large projects this is really you you can end into them uh, through a number of very different routes this is one of the things I really like about engineering some uh, uh, male colleague of mine accused me that this was a very uh, female thing to say that I like the collaborative nature of uh, engineering projects so I think that you know the these huge engineering projects cannot happen unless you bring in a lot of expertise from different sectors. So you cannot do it all alone. And, and this is fun in engineering. I think that you can be the specialist about something, but you also need to, to have the ability to listen to others, to know what they have to say and to take in, take on board different expertise. Yes, so my background was uh, general civil engineering, then uh, general engineering, then civil, then hydraulics, and then I ended up being in geotechnics. How can you access this type of projects through many different ways? I ended up being an academic, and so I was called in when the, the problems were so big that people in real life could not tackle them, so they thought better get somebody from the university. But then, you know, you can get to this project through contractors, you know, you could be on site, you could, could get through these projects by being a designer, so you could be in a designing firm, you could even get to these projects by being a manager, like, you know, you could be the asset manager, you could be an engineer in charge of the transport system in Napoli, so you could still be involved. So there are many, many ways to get involved with these projects, and they are a lot of fun. Great, thank you very much. Um, now, maybe we just take a few questions on the kind of the content uh, that you're talking about. Um, so first of all, what effect does artificial ground freezing have on the environment? And does the use of nitrogen have any side effects? I know you kind of touched on the benefits of that, of nitrogen already, but think maybe more about the environmental impact. Okay, so environmental impact, uh, uh, artificial ground freezing is often being quoted as very good for the environment because you're not leaving anything in the ground. So essentially anything, if you want to construct a tunnel in granular materials under the water table, you will have to do something to the, to the soil. So, you know, one of the things, you will, what I'm talking is not a long tunnel, because then if you're uh, constructing a long tunnel, you will do it by mechanized tunneling. So using some form of TBM, tunnel boring machine, but this would not be economical or practical for short, large diameter tunnels, such as uh, platform tunnels. So in this case, you would do that in conventional mining, that means using conventional mining equipment like uh, road header, the headers or backhoes or something like that. But that means you cannot do it unless you do something to the ground. And typically the, the conventional option is to inject cement. So you inject cement, you make it uh, like a very low quality concrete around block, and then you excavate into that. But then you leave the cement in the soil. Cement has a very high carbon footprint, so it's not a very good idea. Whereas if you freeze and thaw, you're essentially leaving everything uh, as it was before. You've constructed the tunnel and you don't leave anything there. But you have to consider the costs of uh, the energy 
because if you're running a brine plant, then you have the energy to, to keep refrigerating this fluid. And in the case of the nitrogen, the cost of the nitrogen. So there is, you know, the, the, the carbon footprint calcul calculations for the nitrogen cycle are very, very difficult. So this is a, a calculation that as civil engineers, we, we were not trained to do, at least my generation. So we were never trained to, to work out what the carbon footprint of your works would be. You're trained what the cost is. So how, how many uh, pounds do I spend on it? Not how much carbon do I generate by it. But this is becoming very pressing and very important. So we need to be able to, to do this. Use less, use less resources, be less, uh, uh, you know, we must learn to leave a smaller footprint. So this is one topic that in fact, I don't think the calculation because the nitrogen is very difficult. The brine is easy. Because the brine, you calculate the energy that it requires to keep this refrigeration plant. And you must consider that uh, you have to compare it with other techniques. So if you're not freezing, you're doing something else. And the something else might mean, for instance, the watering. And then you, the watering means you have to have a pump uh, pumping out the water. So you have energy to pump the water out. So you have to compare the two costs and uh, they're possibly comparable. The nitrogen is a bit trickier because it, it also depends where you put the boundaries. So where is it, which system you're considering the carbon footprint? I don't think it's been done before. So in fact, I'm working on it with uh, a guy here in the Department of Engineering who is the leader of a group research group, which is called Useless. And they do exactly this. They do carbon footprint uh, calculations for the, so this is, so from the point of view of what you leave in the ground, extremely environmentally free. You don't leave anything in the ground, you don't use cement and so on. From the point of view of energy consumption for the brine cycle, possibly comparable, in fact, a little less than, the, than keeping some pumps active. From the point of view of the nitrogen cycle, I'm not so sure. I would be lying if I said I know. Um, we're working on it and it's a very good question. It's something that one wants to know. My gut feeling, is that this is much more environmentally free than other construction techniques. So it might be a bit expensive, but very good from the point of view of carbon footprint. Great, thank you. Um, another more technical question. Um, how would using artificial freezing technology differ in slightly heavier soils? So say that again in slightly. How would the, the technology differ in heavy, in, if you're using it on heavier soils? Well, heavy, heavy or light uh, is not... Um, uh, it's not the issue here, really. You can use that. Yeah. So, so for instance, when you do it, it it's uh, more to do with the, let's say permeability. Let's talk about permeability. So how big the pores are in your uh, solid matrix. So if you have something that is uh, extremely large pores, so imagine that your soil is like big cobbles, like uh, think of apples, a lot of apples with a lot of voids. Then when you freeze, the pores are so big that the water can move quite freely between the pores. So the curvature of the soil water, the, the ice water interfaces in order to go through a pore, they don't need to curve that much. So you don't need big suctions. You don't generate big suctions because there is not a lot of curvature on the ice water interface. And so essentially you freeze without big volume changes. So the, the only volume change you will see is then possibly you won't even see the 9% increase of volume of the water because as the, the ice freezes, it displaces out the water. So the water goes out. So you don't increase in volume. If you are really, really, really fine grained, like a clay, this is really, really fine grained, then not a lot of water can come into the soil as you freeze. So even if there are suctions, it doesn't matter. You freeze before anything happens. So you can very easily predict the volume change because it's going to be nine percent of whatever water was in the clay to start with because the water the, the pores are so small that the water can go in and out the interesting case is when you have fine suns like this pyroclastic suns because the pores are not so small that the water can't go in and out and in fact but are small enough that there is a big curvature of the ice water interface so there is a lot of suction and a lot of water comes in so you get this effect of uh, big heave on, on freezing is maximized. So uh, the, the technique will have different problems depending on the different type of soils you're dealing with. And I think that uh, intermediate grain soils are the most difficult. Also, you must consider that clays are not very permeable. So generally you can get away 
we dig in a tunnel in clay under the water table because you don't get water coming to excavation. If you, when and if you will decide to study civil engineering and sensor mechanics, this will be very obvious. But if you think about it, in London, the underground was built by the Victorian engineers well before all this thing about water soil was uh, understood properly. And they could dig it north of the river because they have the London clay. They did the all of the London underground in the London clay. No problem, it's a clay I can excavate. Even if I'm a poor, poor, they were really super engineers, but you know, a Victorian engineer. I don't have a real understanding. You see, another example of a construction process that happens before you understand it properly. So the Victorian engineers were building. They didn't exactly know why this was working. They knew it were working clay, no tunnels south of the river. So the, the underground system south of the, of the Thames is much more recent and uh, much less extended because that's all silty sands, sands and silts. So it's the Wallach and Reading beds and their silts. Can't dig a tunnel in a silt under the water table without a TBM without a ground freezing, without cement. So they couldn't and they didn't. So, you know, it's not the, the weight of the soil, really. It's, it's more the permeability, the, the, the texture. If it's fine grained or coarse grained, that is what is determining the story. Great, thank you. Um, and then aware of the time, I think we'll make this the, the last question. Um, well, hopefully we've got lots of prospective female engineers here today. And I think um, there was probably an awareness that we had five male current students earlier, and they did say that it's a quite a male dominated course. Um, so somebody's asked, how's your experience as a female engineer been? And have you ever faced any sexism in this role? Oh, tricky one. So I think that, uh, okay, uh, not only I am a woman in engineering, but I am a woman in civil engineering and tunneling engineering. I think that tunneling engineering must be the most male dominated engineering ever because in a way I can understand that because if a woman a young girl is uh, bright and smart and she likes maths and she likes physics it is very likely that uh, she will be attracted by something that is very modern engineering like you know AI or machine learning or whatever whereas this uh, civil engineering you know calls to mind you walking with your boots in the mud is something from the last century something that to a woman with a very bright mathematical mind, maybe that's not come as the, uh, the preferred option. Whereas I think it's, I don't know, I think it's civil engineering is really amazingly good fun. It's good fun because, you know, you have these large projects because you get to travel because you leave a, a you know, a shade behind you. Like, you know, you leave a bridge behind you and that's something that you see very clearly. I mean, you might advocate that even people that do artificial intelligence, you know, we all depend on things that are not civil, but you know, whatever. If there is a, yes, you will, uh, will encounter, uh, it's not that this, um, I, d I don't think I've ever encountered any um, aggressive uh, sexism in my career. I've been, never been, uh, been uh, bullied or harassed or uh, nothing like that. I would lie if I said this was the case. But it can be difficult because uh, uh, people can be dismissive and, uh, and sometimes they, they are uh, sexist even without knowing. So it's, uh, it's uh, very you know, nuances, things that uh, that are not quite right when you think about them, but they were not meant to offend, but you know, they can be a bit funny. And also uh, two more things. One is that you have, uh, you, you have to interact a lot, particularly if you are on construction sites and stuff like that, you have to interact a lot with the people that are not used to a woman being in charge or, you, you know, and I'm not talking the colleagues in the engineers. I'm more talking, you know, the, the workmanship, the people that, you know, will uh, will uh, uh, wolf whistle at you if you're young and pretty and you think, no, you know, I'm the engineer, I'm in charge. This is not happening. But, you know, it takes a little bit of shoulders to do that, but then it's fun. It's good fun to be there. And the other thing is that I think that in engineering, sometimes I feel that the worst enemy is oneself. So this is out of my experience. So sometimes it's happened to me when I was younger that I would see an advert for a position, maybe, you know, a lectureship at some uh, prestigious uh, engineering department someplace. And I would read the job description and say, Oof, uh, you know, they're, 
they're looking for somebody really, you know, above um, my ability. I, I, I would see that, I would tell myself that I didn't fit the role. And then I would walk down the corridor and there is the most stupid of my academic colleagues in my university that says, have you seen the advert? Uh, I've applied. <laughs> Look at them and you think, what? Like, you know, I thought I was not good enough for the job and you've applied. So you discovered that some male colleagues that you don't think are quite as bright as you have applied. So what I'm trying to say to the, the women that are in the audience is that sometimes we lack confidence. So the first person that lacks the confidence to, to bring us is ourselves. So we, we are very harsh judges of ourselves, whereas we're perfectly okay. We might have uh, sometimes different ways of thinking or different ways, but we are good at what we do, typically very good. So it's uh, So we have to take the responsibility of our life and academic, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm talking your career life, your professional life in your hands. So, you know, you have to take it in your hands and get that confidence that is going to take you to where you want to be. Because if you don't take this responsibility yourself, it's not going to happen. And sometimes girls are not so good at that. So sometimes they, you know, step backwards instead of saying, hey, here I am, I'll take the challenge, I'll do it. So step forward for the challenging jobs, the, the, the difficult jobs, step forward, go for them. Go for the difficult jobs, the challenging jobs. Don't go for the jobs that nobody wants because that's another very typical female characteristic. When I've led many teams and you know, whenever you lead a team, research, real life engineering, there are a number of jobs that need to be done. And some of them are not fun at all. Somebody will have to empty the bins. And if I am the leader of a team and I say, so who's volunteering for emptying the bins? You can be sure that the woman will volunteer. So don't do that. Let the men volunteer for emptying the bins and you volunteer for the good jobs, the challenging jobs, the, the fun jobs. So that's my advice. Great, thank you very much for yeah, your insights there as well. And I'm sure, um, well, I really hope we've inspired lots of female engineers now. We definitely want it to be the case that it's 50-50, don't we? We don't want it to be yeah. really a male-dominated course. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. Thank you very much, Julia, for your time, for your talk. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you for um, moderating this. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.